Uh, and I'd just like to uh, warmly welcome all of you to this um, third public seminar uh, for this year. Uh, the previous ones, um, in case you haven't seen them on the website, were uh, one we did um, back, in, back in March on PNG, uh, where to from here, which we could probably run again later in the year, but um, uh, we had uh, Dr Ron May uh, from the ANU was involved in that, and Marie O'Keefe, who was, used to be Director General uh, at AusAid, and uh, Mr Sean Dorney, the veteran ABC reporter, uh, which was a terrific evening. Then later in March, um, we did one uh, public seminar with uh, Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman uh, on the significance of uh, the American pivot towards the Asia-Pacific in American grand strategy. Uh, tonight we're focusing on the um, Defence White Paper, uh, and I'll come back to that in a moment, uh, and I'd just like to flag with you that the next of these public seminars uh, will be on the 30th of May, um, and it'll be focusing on the role uh, and priorities of the National Security Legislation Monitor, and in fact we will have the Monitor himself uh, delivering that uh, address, um, Mr Brett Walker SC, who's a distinguished barrister in Sydney and appointed by uh, the federal government to the role of National Security Legislation Monitor, so I think that'll be a very interesting occasion as well in terms of his own thinking. Um, we have around nine of these public seminars a year um, uh, and we're very pleased to uh, have it as part of our outreach program and to see it um, resonating uh, with the broader community here in Canberra. Uh, drawing from government and uh, non-government um, sectors. Uh, late last year, we were looking at the program of issues that we would um, cover in the first six months, and um, I'd have to say with, uh, uh, with a certain degree of um, forward-looking uh, understanding, it was put that we should probably do something on the 2014 Defence White Paper, and I said it seemed a long way away, but maybe we could shape the debate early on. So we, uh, we went with it and um, events seem to have worked our way. It's now an urgent issue um, through no doing of our own. So um, the timing is, is excellent. Um, we've got three uh, eminent speakers with three um, quite different backgrounds um, and I think will give us three very informed perspectives. Uh, others in this room will be able to contribute uh, later on but I'm delighted that uh, uh, that we've got Peter and we've um, got Rod and Mark here this evening. I'd like to hand over now for the rest of the evening to um, Dr Chris Roberts, who's on our academic staff at the National Security College um, and who's done a lot of work drawing this uh, occasion together. But can I just, as Director, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for your continued support and we look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thank you. Chris. Thanks, Thanks Michael. It is indeed an honour uh, to stand here uh, before you all and to introduce three speakers who have had as much expertise in uh, defence-related issues as those that sit before us uh, today. Each speaker has provided a strong contribution to defence and the debates that concern it. For example, Dr Rod Lyon has published on a range of issues, including Australia's alliance with the US, while Dr Mark Thompson was a ministerial advisor during the development of the 2009 Australian Defence White Paper, and Professor Peter Lay uh, was a Lieutenant General and Chief of Army when he retired in July uh, 2008. More specifically, in the case of uh, Rod Lyon, he is currently the Program Director for Strategic and International Affairs at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute an organisation where, coincidentally, I served as an intern uh, back uh, 10 years ago. It's amazing how the time uh, uh, flies. He was previously a senior lecturer uh, in international relations at the University of uh, Queensland, and before this, he worked in the strategic analysis branch of the Office of National uh, Assessments. Importantly, his research interests include Australian strategy, global and regional security, and nuclear weapons strategy and proliferation. Rod was also awarded a Fulbright scholarship uh, to study alliance relations at Georgetown University and some of his other publications include The Eagle in a Turbulent World, Forks in the River and A Delicate Issue, Asia's Nuclear uh, Future. Meanwhile, Mark actually began his career as a theoretical physicist 
uh, where he held a teaching and uh, research posts in both Australia and the United Kingdom. Then, in the mid-1990s, Mark joined the Australian Defence, uh, or Department of Defence, where he worked until he commenced his new position, where he remains also at the Australian Strategic Policy uh, Institute. Uh, Mark's own research and publications focus on a wide range of issues, including the links between strategy, force structure, and defence industry policy, alliance burden sharing, and, interestingly, defence economics, which is a particularly relevant uh, topic given the politics of the last uh, week or two. Last, but by no means least, is Peter Lay. Uh, aside from 37 years in service as a professional soldier, during his six years as Chief of Army, his command coincided with the continuous global deployment of Australian so uh, soldiers in fast-paced, complex and demanding combat operations. During this time, he led the rapid expansion and development of the Army, including its special forces, for the purpose of meeting the shifting demands of modern conflict and the evolving regional and global security environment. A key goal in his development of the Army was to produce a hardened and networked Army with increased adaptability and flexibility, together with the ability to provide a broad range of domestic uh, expeditionary and development options to government. Peter is now professor and the founding director of the University of Canberra's National Security uh, Institute. He remains highly active on defence related issues uh, through his writing, frequent media, media interviews and his positions in various boards and organisations such as a director of the Kokoda Foundation. So without further ado, as I invite Dr. Rod Lyon to the lectern, please once again uh, join your hands in welcome. Thank you, Chris, for your introduction, and Michael the Strange for offering the uh, good offices at the National Security College to organise this event tonight. And thank you, good people, for coming out on a cold autumn night in Canberra, something that makes you think winter has come early. Uh, I think each of us have about 15 minutes to speak, which means the messages are going to be a little bit compressed. But in, in my 15 minutes, I want to try and do three separate things tonight. I want to start by talking a little bit about what's changed in the strategic environment since the 2009 Defence White Paper. Uh, then I want to make some initial judgments about the future settings for Australian strategic policy that I think the Defence White Paper of 2013 ought to be um, cognizant of. And, and I suppose I want to, last of all, make some observations about the politics of ownership of Defence White Papers. <coughs> uh, let, let me start with point number one, the first issue about what's changed in the strategic environment uh, since 2009. I think this is the easiest bit of tonight's presentation because I think since 2009 we've seen a quickening tempo of strategic change. Uh, Aspie tried to capture that thought in one of the publications that it put out last year, uh, a strategic assessment entitled Changing Pace in which it tried to suggest that uh, there was a tempo of change that perhaps the 2009 Defence White Paper hadn't quite got on top of. And the, the, what, it, what it sort of implied was that the rate of strategic change is variable and is not fixed. Uh, sometimes it will run a little faster, perhaps sometimes a little slower. But since 2009, we've seen China become more assertive in Asia, not just more assertive, I think more of the games it wants to play have more of a win-lose character to them rather than a win-win character to them. And that's helped take the edge off some of that win-win um, soft power attractiveness uh, that China had in its diplomatic settings uh, back in the early years of the 21st century. I think we've seen an indebted and cautious Japan um, suffer the effects of the Great East Asian Earthquake of March 2011. Um, so an earthquake and a tsunami and a nuclear accident that has helped make Japan a little more introverted and a little more cautious 
even on some of those even on some of those aspects of its strategic policy where, where it was beginning to open up. I think we've seen Southeast Asia increase in strategic significance as strategic weight continues to move south in Asia. As weight moves south, Southeast Asia finds strategic significance thrust upon it, whether it wishes that or not. I think we've seen growing Indo-Pacific linkages as we find that the two oceans are increasingly tied together, that the strategic uh, linkages between them continue to strengthen, and that those linkages are making the Indian Ocean steadily more important, uh, both for Australia and for other East Asian players. I think we've seen a US rebalancing towards the Asia Pacific, and a shifting US regional footprint, part of it directly related to our own new forms of cooperation with Washington. I think we see an end in sight in Afghanistan. I don't want to use the metaphor of the light at the end of the tunnel because it has too many historic connotations. Um, but I do think that even on Afghanistan, we're still in a position where there's no guarantee of a happy long-term outcome. I think as we've, we've now seen uh, Osama bin Laden dead and transnational terrorist structures comparatively weakened. Again, the question mark I put about that is, how long does that situation last? Because we've been throwing a lot of resources at that problem uh, since 2001. We see a Europe that seems to have spent itself into bankruptcy, and, and we see a US economy still struggling for traction. So on a grand scale, I think a transformational Asia continues to unfold, but with very mixed and sometimes competing strands. We see continuing economic enmeshment, but that's accompanied by a continuing reluctance of regional powers to become regional reassurers, and a continuing growth in the hedging capabilities across the region. So overall, rate of change perhaps faster than was anticipated in the 2009 white paper. Rate of change is not by itself dangerous. Um, as long as we're conscious of it, as we're conscious of it. Dynamism is not necessarily a strategic factor that's good or bad, but it is a, complicate, is a complicating factor. Uh, I think we see a region that's not yet slipping either towards conflict or towards community, but a region that could be poised to go either to become more cooperative or more competitive. Second issue, the realigning of the policy settings. I think this is a slightly tougher issue for me because I suspect all three presenters here tonight are going to be in favour of better alignment between strategy and capabilities and budget. But I think as a key part of that, we have to take the strategy part of the white paper more seriously. I think what Australian strategic policy needs most of all is in fact not hardware. <coughs> Despite the fascination of Australian media with heavy metal and with big buckets of money, I think Australian strategic policy needs a better matrix to guide that policy, and in particular, to guide the policy towards the transformational Asia. I think this is not just a task for the white paper, white, white paper drafters, because a white paper on defence is inevitably going to prioritise defence policy. I think our defence policy, however, must be nested in much stronger understanding of what we might think of as Australian strategic policy. And I think over time we've become confused about um, the two of them. We've confused defence policy with strategic policy. In part that's because we've overindulged on what we might think of as capabilities-based planning in defence. But I think it's also a longer term effect that we've, we've started to think of our strategic policy as being too closely tied up with the doctrine of defence of Australia. Uh, if you go and look at the 09 white paper, uh, it says that our single most important strategic interest is defending the continent of Australia against armed attack. I think defence of Australia is our most basic and important defence interest, but I actually don't think it's our most important strategic interest. I think strategy is about getting the world that you want. And we've progressively devalued the coin of strategy by pretending that it's not our business. I think our prime strategic interest is about order building and not about hedging. 
And there are two things you ought to know straight away about order building. One, it is never finished. It is a verb and not a noun. And secondly, it is primarily done by the political arm of policy making rather than by the military arm. I think our most important strategic interest should say what we want, what we want the world to look like, and what we most want. What is, our, what is the key thing that would make us feel safe? Because I think the key thing that makes us feel safe is having a secure, liberal, prosperous Asia. Not because we can protect the continent against armed attack. So I think we should aim at a white paper that says our strategy is about more than a plan for defending Australia and more than a plan that comes with an attached list of weapon systems that we hope to procure. Strategically, I think we should aim for a better upstream-downstream balance in our Asian engagement strategy. We should aim for a more cooperative Asia, try and shape that Asia, even while we hedge against a more competitive one. To do that, we need to try and grow the role of Asian great powers as regional reassurers, and we need to actively pursue new strategic relationships in Southeast Asia. We need to get beyond that judgment of the 09 White Paper about keeping our neighbourhood weak so that we can be strong amongst a series, that we can be a giant amongst a series of midgets who live close by. As a complementary effort, we should think more about what we want ANZUS to do for us in the future. I think ANZUS is treated ambivalently in the 09 White Paper. We need to put aside that notion about relying on our alliance only if we find ourselves fighting a major power. I think that was a misjudgment in the 09 White Paper, and I think we should try and unpack an Asia that's more relevant for us in the 21st century than the 20th century one that came across that century's divide back in 2000. I think that ANZUS will be a more substantive one than the one we became accustomed to during the days of the Cold War. And I think we should see it as a reassurance mechanism, both for ourselves and for the region. Also, I think if a 2013 white paper is going to be looking out to 2018, then there are some particular things we might want to revisit in relation to ANZUS, and one of them might be extended nuclear deterrence, but I don't want to get into that topic too closely tonight. I think if the White Paper does all those things, or if our strategy does all those things, then I think it should be an open question at the start, an open question that drafters have in relation to what they advise in terms of core capabilities and the funding necessary to support it. And in this sense, I'm not attracted by the Prime Minister's closing off options about core capabilities during the initial commissioning of the White Paper. Something that said, something that put her imprint on, on, a, on a design that said all the core capabilities will be retained. If they're all going to be retained, why do you have a White Paper at all? Third issue, and I'll be relatively brief here, but I think it's an important one. It's what I would call the 2013 white paper and the politics of ownership. I think in strategic policy, as in other areas of life, we shouldn't ignore the importance of ownership. Nobody washes a rented car, and nobody champions a white paper that they do not own. So I'm broadly in favour of our Prime Minister having ownership of our strategic policy. I think Julia Gillard will be much better placed to drive the shape and content of the document that comes out in 2013 than she was in 2009, because I see the 2009 Defence White Paper as very much Kevin Rudd's document, and it's never been clear to me that Julia Gillard had ownership of it. But I have one major problem with the 2013 White Paper, and that is it's going to be a document produced in an election year and that election might see the government either return or deposed. I think if the ALP is returned, not a problem. In fact, I think there's some upside for declaratory strategy in having a Labour white paper already through before the election takes place. If the coalition is returned, I think we immediately return to the question of ownership. 
And that's especially true if the election result is a lopsided one, because there are some who would interpret the lopsided victory as a sign of the electorate's rejection of not only the ALP, but of all its works, which might put a question mark about legitimacy over the white paper that sits there from 2013. What would that mean? It would mean that in 2014 we might have a problem. A problem that we would have a 2009 white paper that we had walked away from and a 2013 white paper that a new coalition government had disowned. That might put Australian declaratory strategy in an awkward position because I suspect that the coalition is not in a good position to write its own new version of a defence white paper or even a defence update any time within the 12 to 18 months after their election. During that time, ministers are learning about their portfolios. They're trying to know their own minds on a lot of the big issues of the day, and those include strategic issues. So overall, I think there's a shifting strategic environment. I think there's a need for us to be much more adroit in thinking about how we relate to that environment, that is, relating to it upstream as well as downstream. And politically, I think there's an ownership problem that we should be conscious of. Let me stop there and we can go on to others. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by thanking the National Security College for convening this event. Um, I believe defence policy is too important to be left to a clique of supposed experts to worry about. It's a, a set of issues that needs to be thought about and debated and owned by everyone in the broader community. And events like this help that to happen. On to the white paper. To properly discuss the scope and potential of the 2013 defence white paper, it's necessary to understand why it's been brought forward at this time. The government cited no less than 11 developments behind its decision. Be they as they may, the white paper had to be brought forward, from my point of view, for one simple reason. Existing plans had simply become untenable. Not only had a gap emerged between the means and ends, between the money and the plans, but the department's internal budget had become distorted and unsustainable. Although only three years old, the plans for Australia's defence set out in Defence 2009 are in urgent need of fixing. This is hardly a revelation. It's been clear to anyone looking at it for at least the last 12 months that the 2009 Defence White Paper was dead. It's not that the long-term aspirations set out in that document are impossible. They're not. 20 years is a long time. But the short to medium term plans towards what was described as Force 2030 have been in disarray for that period. Three factors have brought about the present predicament. First, the government has placed a higher priority on delivering a surplus than on, a, on adhering to its plans for the development of the Defence Force. Over the past three budgets, more than $18 billion of funding that was promised in the White Paper has been deferred or cut across the forthcoming decade. Second, Defence has been unable to initiate or deliver new equipment projects at anything like the pace envisaged in the 2009 White Paper. For two years in a row, we've seen last minute opportunity purchases used to soak up unspent money, including no less than two C-17 aircraft. Nonetheless, last financial year, more than a billion dollars of unspent investment money was returned to the coffers of Treasury. Third, the decade-long financial plan at the heart of the 2009 Defence White Paper was flawed. It was built on overly optimistic estimates and on an incomplete understanding of the true cost of developing and delivering military capability. Exaggerated claims of multi-billion dollar savings were thrown into the mix with unrealistic estimates 
of the costs of acquiring and operating equipment. This budget, more than $2.8 billion of previously planned investment funds had to be redirected to meet cost pressures elsewhere within the defence budget. <coughs> Indeed, it was redirected to areas where hundreds of millions of dollars of savings were supposed to come from. No single factor or actor is to blame for the current situation. If the government had given defence all the money that they'd promised in 2009, Defence would not have been able to spend it. Conversely, had Defence been able to spend all the money they had promised back in 2009, the government still would have reneged in favour of delivering a surplus next financial year. Defence 2009 was neither deliverable in practical terms nor affordable in political terms. It was an unrealistic fantasy twice over. The 2013 White Paper has to put some rigour and reality back into planning for Australia's defence. At the most coarse level, there is a fundamental decision to be made. Either scale back, or perhaps delay plans for the future defence force, or provide money, a lot more money, to restart the path to building a larger and more potent force. In the time remaining, I want to make three points. The first is about funding, the second is about strategy, and the third is a judgement that I want to share with you. So what are the prospects for increased funding so over the next five to ten years? <coughs> the government has said it remains committed to the core capabilities of the White Paper and has listed ten capabilities in that category. Of these, eight are already underway. One is small and largely irrelevant, and the one remaining one of interest is the politically potent promise of 12 submarines. But even here, the government's commitment is wavering. With the, with the White Paper's vision of highly capable, new generation submarines competing with much less capable and far less expensive off-the-shelf designs. It appears, therefore, that the government is open to the possibility of closing the gap between means and ends by downgrading its vision for the size and weight of Australia's Defence Force. This is consistent with their citing the aftermath of the global financial crisis as one of the developments prompting an early white paper. In fact, the economy and the government's fiscal situation have fared much better than expected back when the white paper was put together at the start of the GFC. What this tells us is that the government's priority for defence has fallen rather than its absolute ability to pay if it wanted to. Put simply, the government is putting a higher priority on providing best, better social services like health and education and allowing higher private consumption through less taxes than it is putting on buying planes, ships and artillery. That's their prerogative. This assessment of the government's priorities has given further credence by their mention of a need to readjust as the Defence Force draws down from operations in Afghanistan and elsewhere. As has been the case after every war that Australia has fought over more than 100 years, it is almost inevitable that defence spending will moderate and the Defence Force will shrink when the troops are back in the barracks. Public opinion has also shifted. The strategic and fears Strategic fears and misgivings of the post-9-11 decade have been replaced with the uncertainty and economic caution of the post-financial crisis decade. In 2005, 20% of Australians said that either terrorism, wars and conflict, safety and security or world peace were the most important issue facing Australia. Today, that figure stands at 1%. Between 2001, in the aftermath of East Timor, and 2010, support for higher defence spending has fallen from 60% to below the halfway mark, to 45%. On balance, therefore, we are probably at a watershed moment when the growth of defence spending and plans for the defence force are about to be moderated. And I do not think that a change of government will alter this. The opposition's resistance to the latest rounds of cuts has both been mooted and 
carefully caveat. This is not a surprise. With a commitment to roll back both the carbon and mining taxes, not to mention a new paid maternity leave scheme to implement, they are arguably in more dire fiscal circumstances than the government. You say something about the strategy. The 2009 Defence White Paper was schizophrenic. On the one hand, it retained the traditional and ultimately modest Defence of Australia narrative. What we need to do is defend the continent against attack by something less than great powers, that's a critically important caveat, and be able to maintain order in our new region. Any other tasks, it said, like contributions to US or coalition operations, would then be feasible from the force structure so derived, provided we make sure that that force is interoperable and adapted to operations in theatres further afield. On the other hand, the 2009 Defence White Paper talked about capabilities such as 12 long-range high-performance submarines that can operate in North Asia, along with a broader expansion of our maritime forces. In short, it said one thing and did another. But it did not do that other thing very well. It was, in a sense, half pregnant. It certainly went nowhere near the sort of robust middle power strategic weight that some commentators have been calling for to deal with the changing balance of power in the Asia Pacific. In the 2013 Defence White Paper, the government may, needs to make a clear choice about the strategic role that Australia will play in the decades ahead and build a defence force consistent with that role. If they choose to retain the narrative of 2009, they should shape a defence force to that ultimately modest aspiration. If they are persuaded by the arguments of those who believe that we need to be able to exert meaningful strategic weight among the great powers of Asia in the 21st century, perhaps, if you read today's papers, to the extent of being able to fend off a great power, they need to be clear about this. And they need to convince taxpayers that they should be paying a lot, probably an awful lot more, for defence over the decades ahead. <coughs> Finally, let me leave you with a judgment. I do not believe that it is either necessary or desirable for Australia to pursue a major and sustained military expansion at this time. Moreover, I do not think that it is possible for us to reach the critical mass to have a decisive strategic effect on or between the nuclear equipped great powers of Asia in the decades ahead. Let me be clear, I'm arguing here that Australia can and should recut its plans for the Defence Force along more modest lines. To think that we can have the sort of strategic effect that some people argue we should aspire to is unrealistic. To think we can do that would be like Denmark believing that it could shape the strategic affairs of Europe in the 1930s or the 1940s. <coughs> Pretend we can would entail incurring large costs with no, change, no chance of changing the outcomes strategically in our region ahead. Thank you. Michael, uh, thank you for the invitation and Christopher, thank you for organising the event. For those who expecting that I'll talk exclusively about military capabilities, I'm afraid I'm going to be something disappointed. First I want to talk about the decision to release this white paper early, then discuss some views on an alternative context for the white paper, and then talk about threats, tasks and toys. First the 2013 white paper. In the announcement that there was to be a new white paper, the Prime Minister said there had been a number of significant developments since the 2009 White Paper that were having an impact on Australia's defence posture, future force structure and defence budgets. Well, I'm not convinced that they are a compelling reason for an early White Paper. The global financial crisis has been a constant since 2008. The Force Posture Review found that widespread changes in our locations were not required and regional shifts in economic weight 
require shifts in economic policy, not defence policy. The Prime Minister also seems to be cashing in on a general withdrawal from global missions before they've actually happened. We might have declared transition in Afghanistan, but I think it's too early to declare victory. Many seem distracted by China. Some would have us move from a 2009 white paper hedge to a 2013 white paper for structure determined. I think we're moving too quickly. Of course, though, we need to be concerned about the inevitable rise of China, and it will continue to perplex and confuse strategic thinkers. But more on China later. So why have a white paper? Well, you could do it for political purposes. Let's have another review, obscure the real issues and delay the need to make hard decisions. And the government and the minister have fallen in this regard. Perhaps the real reason for the new white paper is that the 2009 white paper was butchered on the floor. It was an adequate white paper, muted by a lack of support from the same government that commissioned and wrote it. Failure was inevitable after the promised 3% annual increase in funding was withdrawn. An extensive savings program was implemented. Efficiency dividends were applied to defence and allocated capital funds were handed back. The last rights of the 2009 White Paper were read on Budget Day this year with $5 billion ripped out of future expenditure. And the messages from the service chiefs released on the 11th of May show the savagery and impact of the decisions contained in the budget. With the due date of the first half of 2013, 12 months away, it's difficult to see how Defence will be able to produce a new and quality white paper. White papers require an enormous effort to write and then they have to be shepherded through the political and the NSC process. And in that 12-month period, we'll see the lead-up to a 2013 election. We know now that our politicians are easily distracted and unable to focus on long-term strategic <coughs> issues. It's hard to see how a rushed white paper developed in the context of a federal election in the absence of a clear view of our strategic situation in a severely constrained financial environment stands any greater chance of being any more durable and capable of implementation than the one written in 2009. My second topic, an alternative context for a defence white paper. It's fitting that a seminar organised by the National Security College that I spend some time talking about the defence white paper in the context of the 2008 National Security Statement. And here you'll have to forgive me for thinking like a soldier and expressing a view that government policy should be based on a hierarchy of declared values, interests, objectives, policies and documents. There should be an overarching narrative providing a clear, comprehensive and compelling whole and nation approach to our security and defence. Today the National Security Statement is three and a half years old and it's showing signs of wear and tear. Despite undertakings to periodically update it, we haven't seen anything yet, and certainly won't see anything in time or influence a new white paper. And we've not seen a defence white paper, or rather a DFAT white paper, which was also tasked in the 2008 National Security Statement. I doubt we'll see that as well. We'll have to make do with the 2003 one. We know that DFAT are under-resourced, distracted by a flood of <coughs> consular work overseas and focused on securing a UN security seat for Australia. So as in previous years, the Defence White Paper will be produced in isolation from the other major players in the national security arena. And I don't think that's good enough. It's not good enough as especially we see increasingly the changing nature of security and new threats and challenges to our well-being and prosperity as Australians. So I'd like to see more work put into what appears to be the stalled move towards a national security community. Michael, I acknowledge the great work that you're doing here and I congratulate you and your staff on that. You're really helping develop a collaborative and cooperative community. But it's difficult to find much momentum elsewhere. The 2012 budget announcement 
cut 20% from the National Security Branch in Prime Minister and Cabinet. We have yet to see substantial work on a national security budget or any articulation of a risk-based approach to national security. Renewed emphasis and vigour is required. And perhaps I could suggest that not only do we need that renewed emphasis and vigour, a new national security statement, but what about the development of a national security strategy? To conclude, conclude this section, let me lament the lost opportunities to be gained by linking our, until recently, increasing aid budget more directly to our national security interests and objectives. The final part, threats, tasks and capabilities. We've barely put Indonesia to bed as a threat and now some are doing their best to invent China as an existential threat. In the US, the movement to demonise China is loudly championed by the ESC battle proponents who are designing a doctrine to directly check China's growing military power. Alarmingly, this smacks of confrontation and containment. And only today we have reports of senior Chinese officials telling Foreign Minister Carr that the time for Cold War alliances has long since passed. We should not forget that our near region and much of the globe remains undeveloped and fragile. In the future, in pursuit of regional and global interests, we're more likely to need boots on the ground protecting and supporting populations than fighters putting missiles through windows in far off capitals or defending against enemy aircraft who have no means of mounting or sustaining an attack on Australia. We also need to be conscious of developments in the emerging human security and responsibility to protect doctrines. These and the progress of the International Criminal Court to define the responsibilities of sovereign leaders all speak of an increased international involvement by Australia and its ground forces. I'm concerned that in an era of tightening budgets and confusion about strategic direction, that we're about to see a return to the polemic debate over the relative priority afforded to the defence of Australia or expeditionary operations. One, the defence of the Australian mainland against a conventional attack is assessed by our intelligence staff as being the least likely eventuality. The other, regional and global missions to support our values and interests is what we've been doing since Cambodia and Somalia over 20 years ago. One requires a focus on enormously expensive platforms, while the other requires people and fewer platforms. There is a question of balance and being able to provide a range of defence options to government. And the answer is that we've got to be able to do both. But the debate is real because of the enormous sums of money involved. Current plans for joint strike fighters and submarines estimate a capital cost for both exceeding $56 billion, and that doesn't include <coughs> through-life costs. I fear that expenditure on this scale will distort the defence budget for decades and constrain the options available to government to deal with a broad range of possible futures. The 2000 Defence White Paper proposed the acquisition of about 100 joint strike fighters. Recently, Professor Hugh White, who was the principal author of that white paper, writing on the Lowy Institute blog, said that it was an arbitrary decision. It was not good enough, and I'm quoting him. It was not, of course, an adequate basis for deciding how many joint strike fighters we would really need. Australia's air combat capability is being replaced on a one-for-one -one basis. This replacement strategy fails to recognise the system of system advances to be achieved through the acquisition of air-to-air -air refuelling and early warning aircraft. The enormous capability enhancements inherent in the Joint Strike Fighter itself and the potential soon to be realised with a technology leap into unmanned aerial combat vehicles. Despite a huge amount of work within the Department of Defence on options for a submarine replacement, Little more is known about the way ahead. About the only sure thing is the intent to assemble the vessels in South Australia. And submarines are essential for our island nation and its defence. And it may be that innovative design and a continuous build program could provide the most effective capability. 
Uh, I, for one, am going to reserve my judgments on submarines until government does their homework and declares a preferred strategy to replace them. With regard to the decision to cancel Army's self-propelled artillery, I think it's ill-conceived. There's a higher likelihood of the self-propelled guns being used than much other equipment that's available. And the cancellation of the artillery means that the Army's combined arms team is incomplete due to a loss of protection and mobility. But clearly, Army had to take its medicine. There's been a chorus of advisers and commentators inside and outside defence who've been busting their chops to reduce Army's capabilities for over a decade. They are of a like mind to those who ran Army down during the 70s, 80s and early 90s. And their particular legacy is an Army that barely coped with the relatively benign de demands of their Timor intervention. The modern day small army proponents will similarly leave army dangerously under-equipped and unable to respond to changing and escalating circumstances. They do this out of some ill-conceived notion that they can see the future and predict what sort of conflict the army will be involved in. The solution is simple. By declaring the requirement for an air combat fleet of about 75 aircraft, 75 JS, F, or, in the interim, 50 JSF and about 25 Super Hornets, we could balance the requirement for budgets into the future. We could also balance the overall force structure of defence. At a conservative cost of $100 million per aircraft, and that's capital cost only, that would release $2.5 billion. In addition to restoring balance to the defence budget, Additional funds could be legitimately returned to government for use in other national security objectives. A priority should be to properly finance the other elements of the national security community, including the Australian Federal Police and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, both of whom are seriously underfunded. Other more immediate and likely threats, such as cyber security, should also be addressed. Rather than deal with individual projects, it's time that Defence thought seriously about joint capabilities and the need to provide a balanced and joined up whole of defence and whole of nation security capability. This requires a careful consideration of the likely threat, budget constraints and a clear appreciation of the most appropriate element of national power to be used. This is a challenge for Defence to rise above single service and departmental parochial interests and contribute to a joint national security force able to provide and sustain the broad range of defence and security options required by the government in the future. Thank you. Thank you to the uh, three of you for some uh, exceptionally well thought out uh, presentations. I think we've seen a broad array of uh, considerations and some areas I think uh, also uh, of uh, consensus. Uh, uh, a couple of themes that popped up at, at different uh, junctures included the, the need for change perhaps in, in terms of uh, uh, the environment faced by uh, defence but that some of the proposed changes or the time frame under which we may have uh, uh, the, uh, for the next defence white paper are not uh, necessarily optimal, perhaps even uh, more uh, political. Uh, we've uh, also uh, seen some thoughts about the nature of defence acquisitions and whether they're the most uh, appropriate, uh, comments about the limits uh, of our uh, power, but also the risk of moving perhaps uh, too quickly in reassessing uh, our future defence uh, posture, the challenge of budget uh, cuts, but not just for defence, but also for other minis uh, ministries that are perhaps uh, under-resourced, uh, such as DEFA, uh, and uh, also the uh, uh, significance of, uh, uh, or some, uh, some significantly practical uh, considerations uh, for future uh, policy formulation. So on that note, I'd like to open the floor uh, to uh, the audience here to ask uh, questions of the three speakers. 
I do ask that you keep your questions short. I hope to uh, give as many of you as an opportunity as possible uh, to, to ask your uh, uh, question. If you do feel uh, comfortable to do so, please also indicate your name and uh, sort of institutional uh, background so the speakers uh, have some idea as to where you're uh, coming from. So, thank you. Um, I think everyone did. Um, but one thing that uh, the three of you didn't actually address was, is a white paper the best way to reassess our strategic circumstances? No white paper's ever been funded. They've all been subjective, and they've largely all failed. Uh, so maybe it's the white paper process itself uh, that is the problem, because it's declaratory policy, and we, never, we can't tell our neighbours what we really think. I think because it is declaratory policy, we need to get something out there, and we've spent a lot of time over the last 30 or 40 years encouraging other countries to have white papers, and I include China in that. So it's a matter of getting a statement on the ground. But then, of course, the issue is, did we really mean that, and what are we doing otherwise? Neil, I've got some sympathy for what you've said, because if you look at a lot of the large purchases and changes in defence, and I think particularly purchases, they've not actually come through the white paper process. Uh, I can joke that they sort of largely appear off trips on VIP aircraft with CDFs of Chiefs of Service that have been with Prime Ministers or other people. And I'm thinking of um, as far back as Kim Beasley and the ASLABs, I'm thinking of C-17s and a range of things like that. So there's a process beyond the white paper, but I do think we need them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I have much to add to what Peter has said. I agree with you that the process is flawed, but I don't see a better substitute to put in its place. I'd make two points. First, I think every white paper process is different. The 87 white paper, the 2000, 2009, and no doubt this, this one will be different too. I, I think, as in any other area of policy development, governments and their public servants and, and military, their military colleagues uh, we need to learn from the past and do a better job the next time round to, to improve things. Um, and hopefully that will occur this time. The uh, second point to make is that because it's a declaratory document, it has limitations in, in how frank it can be. For example, um, I think anybody who thinks clearly about Australian strategic policy realises that we, like the rest of the Western world, free ride on the hard efforts of the United States. I'm not going to put that into a declaratory document, but to think clearly about Australian strategic policy, you'd better understand that that's what the name of the game is. Uh, uh, Jeff Malone, uh, recently a, now a fellow at the Centre for Excellence in Police and Security, hosted here by Regnet, but uh, formerly Army, and my old Chief of Service uh, sitting in front of me. I guess a question for all three, um, focusing on, I guess, acquisition and governance standards within defence. In the wake of the 2000 white paper, there was considerable reform within defence, the, the two-pass process and a whole host of other things relating to capability development and the acquisition process. And that's played its way out over the last decade through the 09 white paper and to the present. These reforms don't seem to have served us terribly well. Uh, in terms of the way in which we develop and acquire capability, we really don't seem to have made much traction. And that's where a lot of the money seems to be lost in this process. So I guess the question I have collectively uh, for the speakers is where to for defence governance in terms of creating an organisation that can in fact deliver capability um, arising out of a white paper or some other policy process. I'll have a go at that if I may. Um, I, I, I think the CNAD and, and, and the subsequent reforms to defence procurement were well intentioned and in many ways have improved um, the process and probably improved the outcomes. I think however, as in any area of public policy, you need to go back and learn and examine what you've done and refine it. And I think uh, the government would be well advised to have a look at what they've done now and find out what parts are working well and keep them, and find out what parts are clogging up the system with mountains of paperwork and slowing things down without adding value, and cast them aside. So I think there's, there's room for further refinement there. 
Um, I, I think you know, somebody once told me about people on aircraft getting deals for equipment. I, I, think, I think we've got to be careful uh, about thinking that the process is going to do everything. At, at the end of the day, the quality of decisions that comes out of, uh, comes out of government in, in any area rests with the attention and diligence with, with, with which ministers do their job. Now, sometimes that might mean that they, they grasp an essential insight on a VIP flight and make a decision, and that might be a valid thing. At other times, they might take um, advice from a very considered and detailed process and make you know, a very deliberate, deliberated decision. Um, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's the care and attention that ministers um, uh, put to the task that will finally determine the quality of the decisions we get. And I think the public and commentators need to hold decisions, uh, hold ministers to account for the quality of the decisions that emerge. <laughs> Almost the past. Uh, it's government money. It's, it's public money, so it has to be spent properly and wisely. Um, but I think the effort to take all the risk out of it has gone too far. And what I found was that it just slowed the process down. And we're particularly, and Jeff, you'd know the, about the, the miners. We're talking about small amounts of expenditure. And I, I know for other departments, $20 million is not small. Uh, but these were things that were, were needed to keep army, in my particular case, running. And to have to go through a two-pass process for miners and so on, I think it just slowed the process down. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Ash. David Conner, National Security College. Rob, maybe one for you. Uh, We've made a number of assumptions about uh, our relationship with Japan and with South Korea and their importance in maintaining a strategic balance in Northeast Asia. I suppose my question to you is how reliable are these two countries, given their, their current situations and their trajectories, uh, as potential allies? Um, I think both Japan and South Korea are reliable partners for us. But the trouble that we have in Asia is finding points of congruence. Um, but we've, for over 20 years, we've encouraged Japan to play a larger role in Asia. Uh, and th this goes back to the days of Paul Keating, when, Ke when Keating decided that it was better to get Japan out into the Asia Pacific while the Asia Pacific was calm, rather than waiting for Japan to lurch out during a time of Asian crisis. Uh, so we've, for 20 years, been trying to pull Japan down a path to play a larger role in Asia. Uh, Japanese policy remains incrementalist, despite that pressure, and I think the earthquake and the tsunami and the nuclear accident just reinforce that incrementalism. Uh, actually, South Korea, South Korea is quite unlike Japan, and I say this having visited both countries in the last couple of months, uh, and going from Tokyo to Seoul is like going to two different planets. Uh, so, when, when you point out a distant vision to, to Japan, they want to go there, but they want to go there one step at a time. When you point out a distant vision to South Korea, they want to go there now, and in fact they want to go somewhere further down that path, to somewhere more distant, and they want to do that now. Uh, so I, I think South Korea and Australia and Japan and Australia do have things they can do together, um, but unpacking it's going to take a little more time, I think. It, it, there's not an immediate agenda there that we can leap out and do together. Uh, hi, I feel like I'm breaking cover a little bit, but um, Senator David Feeney, Parliamentary Secretary for Defence. Um, and I have nobly maintained my silence, but that last question. Um, listen, I guess I'm, on that question of Korea and Japan, I guess I think one of the great anchors in the relationship uh, between Australia and those two countries is energy and LNG um, and the fact that they are um, such reliable and important customers for uh, such a burgeoning part of our industry. The alliance of customer, um, uh, I think, is... It, anyway, I'm interested in your comments as to what extent you think um, uh, energy policy is going to shape some of these things, or you touched a little on, um, I guess, the Malacca Straits and uh, 
the connectedness now between the Pacific and Indian Oceans. Um, I just wonder if you've got any remarks about how um, that architecture or terrain has changed and its impact on the white paper. Uh, I think what you're seeing is that um, not just Japan and Korea, but many Asian countries have an increasing tie to the energy supplies that come out of the Middle East. If you look at that, that part of the energy market that's growing fastest, it is um, non-OECD customers <coughs> buying OPEC oil. Uh, and that's the real growth spurt in the energy market. And what you're finding is that uh, at, at the core of that is growing congruence of interests about secure sea lanes. Uh, and I think if we can't build something on that, then there's something fundamentally wrong. I think one of the... I, I talked in my speech about trying to build better patterns of regional reassurance across Asia. And one of the things we have to reassure is um, stability of resource supplies. Uh, and we don't just do it by being a stable resource supplier ourselves. We do it by trying to line up Asian partners who share that interest in having steady resource supplies and steady access to markets. So uh, when I think back over sort of maritime initiatives of the past, I remember at one time there used to be an initiative that the US was running called the Thousand Ship Navy. Uh, and if you remember the Thousand Ship Navy, it said that the Americans will try and stitch together a global navy that contains contributions from a wide range of countries who share a common interest, and that common interest lies in open sea lanes. Uh, I think, if anything, we need to almost reinvent that sort of initiative. Uh, gentlemen, uh, Mick Keogh from the Centre for Defence and Strategic Studies. Um, a number of you, or I think you all at some point, have spoken about deficiencies in white papers, present and previous. Uh, arguably, many, but not necessarily all of these problems have flown from uh, the absence of white papers being nested in and flowing from documents such as the national a national strategic policy or national security statement. Uh, the old adage being that nature abhors a vacuum, so why be uh, surprised if uh, defence white papers flow into those spaces? Do any of you see an appetite in either of our major political parties to address and change this issue? If not presently, what might have to change for that to occur? Thank you. Um, let, let me say something initially and then I'll pass on to the others. Uh, I, I think if anything, the appetite for a national security statement has gone down. Um, I think that's partly a change of leadership. I think Kevin Rudd was very much a believer that uh, the national security was an idea whose time was done. Um, but I think our current Prime Minister is less attached to that notion. Uh, I think trying to find a coordinated approach to everything in some ways is wrong. Um, it, it, I think you have elements of specialisation that come about from having distinct departments, but when you have those distinct departments, they each bring their own preferences and their own budgets uh, to the round table, to an interdepartmental committee table. Um, and actually the ones with the biggest clout are the ones that shape the outcome. Uh, and I must say that I think the Defence Department is a department that has thick institutional walls. Uh, what it did was manage to wall its own defence budget off from the national security budget. If you remember even when Kevin Rudd stood up and said, we have a defence budget of 27 billion and I have a national security budget of 4.3 billion. Hey, what happened there? Okay. Uh, over 80% of things that you would normally think of as security budget had been fenced off from possible reallocation amongst the other portfolios. Uh, when I made my presentation, I said I thought the defence white paper needed to be nested in a strategic policy. And I do think that's the case. I think the government has to have a strategic policy that has upstream shaping as well as downstream hedging. At the moment, the white paper does a lot of downstream hedging, but it doesn't show how we get to that secure, liberal, prosperous Asia that we want. And the Asia that would be a better guarantee of our own security than having uh, forces that sail around the sea air gap. 
I guess I'll just reinforce that point. Um, I think the Department of Defence has many strengths, but for example, looking at, at the, the upstream and downstream aspects, the, the question of the prudence and the manner in which Australia might want to strengthen its strategic partnerships with Japan and South Korea, I think is something that could benefit not simply from a defence view, but also from a DFAT and Prime Minister and Cabinet view. Now, in a perfect world, we would have a, a coherent national security strategy and approach that would ensure this occurred. And perhaps one day we will. But I would not give up the ghost at this point. It's not beyond the wit of any government to have a defence white paper and ensure that other departments are actively engaged in it. For example, I would be surprised if our new foreign minister didn't take a very active interest in the development of the white paper and the foreign policy and international relations aspects of it. And that's appropriate and that's possible. So I, I wouldn't, sitting from outside, I think it's, it's, it's very easy to think that things are in, in very siloed categories that don't talk to one another. But certainly over the last decade or so, governments uh, and the public service have found ways to work together better than they did in the past. We're not where we need, to, we're, we might not be where we need to be, but, but good progress has been made on interdepartmental coordination on a whole range of issues. Mick, uh, I think I expressed myself pretty clearly in terms of my disappointment of the national security statement, and I think that it has gone out of it. I'd like to see that reinstated. I do think that um, government departments, military and others operate better when they're working together. And you would fully understand the frustration I had with that phrase, whole of government. Um, it was often said, but I don't think it's very often delivered. And I think a joined up strategy at the national security level, whether it's a statement or an explicit statement of strategy, uh, departments producing white papers when they're asked to would be, in first order, would be polite. And it would help bring all those things together. So I am frustrated by a lack of a whole of government approach because I don't think that the future security of Australia is just about its defence. It's about those new threats and challenges. It's about a whole range of other things. And we need to think of security rather than defence of the mainland against a conventional attack, which is where defence seems to be stuck. My name is Hiro Ikematsu, uh, counselor at the uh, Japanese Embassy. I will try to make uh, Japan more reliable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my question is about uh, budget cut this time and uh, 2030 white paper. I want to ask you how you assess the impact of the budget cut this time on the Australian Defence Force. My preliminary assessment is uh, it is not so huge, and uh, it's going to probably bring uh, a couple of years delay in uh, several capability projects and also uh, cut or reduction of the non-essential capability. But uh, I think uh, tougher and more significant choice or decision lie ahead in formulating a 2030 white paper. And uh, I want to have your assessment on the uh, budget cut, uh, impact of the budget cut this time. I'll do my very best. Um, a couple of points to make. First of all, the government is quite properly quarantined the impact of the budget cuts on operational deployments. So East Timor, um, Afghanistan, the troops there will get what they need. Um, where, where the budget... I, the state of the budget at the moment, I, I think, is concern in two areas. One is the capital investment program is taking a kick in the guts. Um, it's down to just a little bit over $3 billion. On earlier projections, it should have been about 6 So you know, capital investment is, is way down. And the, the problem is that capital investment, the mobilisation of industry, the approval of projects, is at the best of times a slow and challenging process. Once you take a big gouge out of half a decade's worth of, worth of money, well, you, you, you 
cause a delay that will probably spread to eight to ten years. So there's probably a lost decade of momentum towards force 2030. Now, of course, you know, between now and 2030, we could, you know, given the precedent, we could put a man on the moon. Okay? It's a lot of time between now and then. Um, I, I, I think, I, I think it's up to the present government in 2013 and subsequent governments to decide what they're going to do. And it, it's difficult to 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 prophesize that. Although although I did I did try. Um, I think the other the other part of, of of the present budget situation is the Department of Defence itself has been it's been made efficient. It's been cut. It's been deferred. It's punch drunk the budget, so to speak. Um, we've got a situation where the amount being spent on personnel is very large, the amount spent on day-to-day -day operations is mm, being cut continuously and probably the next 12 months it's been cut to the bone and unless something happens to remediate that then we're really going to have to start looking at some draconian cuts in, in uh, rates of effort. And capital investment has, has become tiny. The point is that's unsustainable. It has to be put back into harmony, either by reducing the personnel and operating costs to accord with the smaller investment vote, or throwing more money in to increase the investment vote. That's the decision that one of the decisions the government's going to have to make. I'm not one that thinks a delay is a saving. We, we just we just push it out. It's still got to be spent. And I'm not convinced that the financial situation will get that much better. And governments of both persuasion, if they get away with it like this, they'll think, well, we can keep pushing that out. So that's where I think a delay is not a saving. And we're going to have to make the hard decisions. And if you, you have a close look at what's actually happening in those service two statements from the 11th of May say, there, there's going to be quite dramatic impact on training, infrastructure, day-to-day -day operations and undoubtedly on the morale of servicemen and women from all of the three services. And again in this line of what can we do next, um, well how long before people say we need a smaller army? Well, I don't think we do. I joined the army and Neil Jones, you might have to help me, but I joined the army, I know when I joined the army is not in 71. <laughs> that was the 18th of January, 1971, the best decision I ever I made. 33,000 on a population base of, I think, 14 million? About, sorry? No, currently 30,000 on a population base of 22 million. And the world's quite different to what it was then. Um, I think we need to rebalance, get rid of the distortions to make sure we've got a defence force in balance. Can I just say one thing on this. I think at the moment we're trying to judge the impact of budget cuts in a quantitative sense. And I, I think that's too much a focus that goes through, that goes through the public debate. I, I think we should aim first at a qualitative sense. What, whatever impact the budget cuts have, we want an ADF that is capable and competent on the missions that we give it. Now to me, that means I don't much care how many submarines we buy. I don't care if it's six, as long as we can get six in the water. <laughs> so I want submarines that do what they, what, what, you hope, what you hope they're going to do when you buy them. So how we, how we command respect around the region is by having an ADF that works at high quality. I think secondly, there's a quantity issue, but it's a secondary issue. The secondary issue is you can't turn up in an Asia in which defence modernisation is running apace, looking too small. But I think quality comes first and quantity comes second. Uh, Will Taylor, I'm the DA in the British UK High Commission. Um, and an observation and then a question if I may and the observation is about strategic context and all of you have talked to a degree about strategic context and I've looked specifically at elements of introducing the amphibious capability into uh, service and it seems to me that there is a degree of strategic confusion about what it's for which is making life difficult for all the people who are trying to bring it into service because at the one end of the spectrum you have people talking about 
um, saving Private Ryan and storming beaches. And at the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are putting clear limitations on the capability for humanitarian aid and disaster relief and, and that kind of thing. And I think this all comes back to the whole business of having an understanding of what the, strat what the strategic context is within which you're going to set the white paper. Now, I come from a country that has a very clear idea, and some would say rather inflated opinion of its place in the world. <laughs> um, but my question to you is, and I think it's probably part of a national conversation, um, are you confident that Australia has a clear idea of its place in the world? Because I think that is absolutely the context that you need to set before you write your white paper. No. <laughs> Well, I agree with the last speaker, but uh, because you're a Marine, I'm, I'm going to have to answer the, the question on amphibious capability. Uh, I, th single words. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is some confusion, but it is certainly clear in my mind. Uh, we don't have a doctrine similar to the US Marine Corps. In, the, in Australia, we contemplate using the landing helicopter dock to do amphibious assault. We're talking about amphibious lodgement, and there's something quite different involved in both of those activities. So, but I'm not sure that the um, excitable types inside both the Navy and the Air Force quite understand what our doctrine is. So I, I think there's confusion, but it's easily solved. Uh, and I see the LHD being able to support a whole range of activities, but it's got to be part of a joint force. It has to have submarines underneath it when it's going somewhere and it has to have joint strike fighters above it when it's going there and when it gets to what it's going to do. And that's where all the work has to be done to pull the three services together and the army troops on board to make sure we deliver a capability. I'd simply concur that I don't think we have clarity about <coughs> what we want our defence force to do. And I think we are prone to to two maladies. One malady is that we confect missions for things that we have acquired or wish to acquire. Um, and second, you talked about the image of, of your nation. I think Australia has, to some extent, an image of itself as a martial nation. Um, no, no other country celebrates its military history the way Australia does, with our Anzac Day, with, with you know, the conflation of mateship and military service and being Australian. It's a very peculiar thing. And I think that provides a more sympathetic ground for defence spending and for military activities than a lot of other, other countries have. And I think it also allows us to entertain, entertain ideas about our place in the world through the use of military force but are perhaps not realistic. We have uh, time for one last very quick question and uh, at 6.42 uh, and, uh, and some uh, quick, uh, hopefully, uh, responses. Uh, I'm David Goyne and I work for Defence, but occasionally I fought for myself and this is one of those occasions, I think. Uh, I guess this is probably addressed to a right, but it, it's something that might be uh, no problem with anyone else answering. Well, you talked about, uh, if I'm not putting your words right, a stable, prosperous, liberal Asia. And I'm just wondering what shape that will be and what rules there will be for that. I was, you know, I, I sort of knew the, f the facts and figures, but I hadn't really seen them until I saw a recent Price Waterhouse Cooper graph. And it was based on a lot of, you know, probably dubious assumptions of linear growth into the future. But it wasn't a Western liberal future. It was, you know, yes, big European countries were still on there, but they had sunk well back into the ruck. It was a country, uh, you know, a graph dominated by China, India, Indonesia, uh, other countries. What do you think the rules will be in that world? Uh, as usual, David always asks very hard questions. Um, uh, I, I initially want an Asia that is less, as I said in my presentation, I think Asia can go to the more cooperative or the more competitive end of the spectrum. So initially I want to reinforce things that give us an Asia that is less fractious 
and less nationalistic. And to do that, I'm trying to find ways that, that, that give you an Asia that, first of all, it, it, which the leading powers of that region accept that they are consequential powers. That is, they're not like China at the moment who say, don't make us do too much because we're just a developing country. Now, the test is not whether you're a developing country or not. The test is whether you are a consequential power, whether your actions have international consequences. And all of the, grow the rapidly growing countries in Asia are what I call consequential powers. One, I want them to accept that status. Two, I want them to find ways of working with each other. Because in Asia, for a whole region, for whole reasons of, of cultural division and history, patterns of security cooperation across the region are pretty awful. Uh, I mean, we have dialogues and we have meetings, but patterns of hard-edge <coughs> security cooperation and even shared strategic understandings, they're very weak. Uh, and thirdly, I want to find ways in which the fastest growing powers become what I call reassurance powers. Now, at the moment, we have a reassurance contour that's essentially drawn up by the US uh, from the alliance days, and it's rather weakly supported by a set of dialogues. Uh, I want to find a way, and I don't know what it is, but I want to find a way in which the fastest growing powers become suppliers of regional reassurance. That they reassure the countries of the region that there's no early use, to, use of force. That even where they have strategic differences, those differences are nested in a relationship of, of more important <coughs> cooperation to them. Uh, that, that they can be suppliers of some sort of security assurance or guarantees to their neighbours. Uh, that is, I want them to pick up some of the burden of ordering that at the moment is carried by um, the US from its, from its role of primacy. Uh, I think that's the sort of Asia you have to design. I'm, I'm not sure how you get there. I so you know. okay. might uh, uh, leave it there. And uh, I'd just like to, to thank the audience as well uh, for a, a very interesting and broad mix of, of uh, questions. I think, uh, and, and, and as, as Michael uh, uh, indicated, it wasn't originally planned. We couldn't quite foresee that it would become a 2013 white paper, but hopefully the timing of all of this uh, uh, and, and today's uh, uh, session will make some contribution towards uh, leading the debate. Uh, so I'd like you to, once again, please uh, join me in thanking you.